This week on Inside the Headset, we are featuring Western Michigan's head coach, Tim Lester. In this episode, Coach Lester shares his personal experience coaching at his alma mater, highlights how he seeks out young coaching talent in college football, and details what it's like preparing for weekday games in the Mid-American Conference. But first, a word from our partner. The All-State AFCA Good Works team has been one of the most esteemed honors in college football for more than 30 years. The student-athletes who are nominated for this award demonstrate a unique dedication to community service and desire to make a positive impact on the world around them. The Good Works team is comprised of 11 players from the FBS and 11 players from the FCS, Division II, III, and NAIA, as well as one honorary head coach. To be in consideration by Allstate and the AFCA for a nomination, each player must be actively involved with the charitable organization or service group while maintaining a strong academic standing. Past Good Works team members include notable players such as Peyton and Eli Manning, Tim Tebow, Trevor Lawrence, and N'Kobe Dean. Coaches, do you have a player that you think embodies the values of a Good Works team? Be sure to connect with your SID to discuss potential nominees. Nomination forms have been sent out for the 2022 AFC Assistant Coach of the Year Award. To be eligible for this honor, a candidate must be an assistant coach at a four-year collegiate institution, have joined or renewed AFCA membership prior to the start of the 2022 football season, coach in a program that is not on major NCAA, NAIA, or conference probation, and make outstanding contributions in the area of community service, professional organization involvement, and student-athlete development, both on and off the field. Deadline to send in a nomination is May 27th. Coach Lester, how's it going? Doing going great, Mario. How are you, man? It's going fantastic over here. Hopefully you guys had a, a fantastic spring ball. And uh, and I know your, your your coach is probably out, out the office a little bit on the road recruiting. So hopefully that's going well. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely this is the quietest time of the year <laughs> for us. You know, it's still – a lot of planning, but no one knocking on the door, and right. uh, so it's it's a it's it's an exciting three weeks to get some work done around yeah. the office. Absolutely, and, and 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 obviously we have tons of people that listen to this in, in the coaching industry, and so for anybody that's at the high school level, just FYI, head coaches can't get out on the road in the spring, so this is the the, the one time where the head head ball coaches kind of got the got the offices to himself for a little bit. So, um, anyways. You, talking about sitting in that office, uh, that's a familiar place for you, right? Been back home in Western Michigan. Uh, you know, you took the, the head job in 2017. Um, so you're no stranger to the program, record-setting quarterback, uh, four-year starter there. Um, what has it personally meant to you to kind of be back home? Um, and, and, and and what was it like to, to, to accept that job? You know, it, it was a dream come true. You know, I talked to recruits a lot in this office on the other side. And uh, I would say, you know, how many people do you know that have their dream job, right? Everyone has a dream job. And there aren't too many people that you know that have it. Right. You know, and, and I'm sitting in it. I'm living it every day. Uh, I get up, I get to come to work at a place that I love and, and, and it's part of me. It's like where I cut my teeth, you know? So, right. you know, it comes to you at different times. You know, you're, you're so busy. We we're in a world that, that is fast paced, but, um, it, it's this random moment where you turn the corner and you have a memory of something that happened when I was 19 in this room or in this <laughs> building or in this office or on that field or right. in that corner of the end zone. You know, I remember the one, normally I remember the bad one. I remember the pick I threw in that corner. It <laughs> right. still annoys me today. I'll see the corner and I'll picture it's like, God, that was a bad throw or decision. Um, you know, so you just have so many memories that come back of your time. Uh, playing here because this is the helmet I wore, you know. So That's it's right. so much. Uh, where I'm definitely honored to have this opportunity, and and I don't I don't take it for granted every single morning when I wake up. Well, you said something interesting there. You mentioned dream, you know, dream job. I mean, you're right. Everybody has that has that one that they all be excited about. And I would imagine, or it's probably a decent amount of guys that their alma mater would be one of them. Was that was that something that you kind of sought after when you were early on in your career cutting your teeth as a coach? Where you uh, where you saying, man, I would love to get back to Western Michigan. Or you, you know, in that business, in our business, it's it's not that you know, it's not that easy for you to say, I want to go there, and you ever make it there. It just you kind you kind of got to go with the flow a little bit. Yeah, you know, and and my my road my road here was not conventional, right? Uh, by by any shape or form so i was division three division two division one division three acc big 10 here uh so but this was always the goal you know the goal was to to be the head coach here yeah. you know and so uh 
I love coaching quarterbacks. I love being an offensive coordinator. Uh, I have spent a lot of time as a head coach now at, at all three levels. And, and so, um, so it, it, but this was always the end game. That's you know, right. this is what I was, the job I was hoping to get. And, uh, didn't know when, how, where, you know, you can't really plan those things as you know, right. in this profession, you, you don't know where it's going to end, you know, leave you. But, uh, you know, it, it came, it came to fruition and obviously I'm excited about it. Absolutely. Well, you mentioned, uh, unconventional, uh, kind of, kind of background. And I do want to highlight that a little bit. So one of the most intriguing parts, you didn't say it yet. You were a head coach, just for your fifth season in the coaching, which is, you know, I, I, I say, like I said, I'm, before we hopped on the podcast, this is about our 300th podcast. So I've had the opportunity to sit on with a lot of head, head ball coaches. And, you know, I mean, in the fifth year, that's amazing. But on top of that, like you mentioned, you, you've been in high school, Division three, Division two, Division one. Um, just coming up, what, what were some of the commonalities and characteristics of building, you know, successful programs at all the different levels? And what were some of the things that were just so different, you know, um, you know, working at all the different levels? Yeah, it, I get that. I get asked that question a lot, you know, and I, I, I tried to high school coaching for a year or two. It was just kind of a volunteer basis and then got into college. Because that, that helped me figure out I wanted to coach college. And, and then I was at D3 a couple of years and I got a D2 head job at 24, 5, whatever I was and learned a ton. You know, probably made more mistakes than good decisions, more yeah. bad decisions than good decisions. And, uh, we were at a place that we had to do the laundry and line the field and water the field. And I was like Googling, you know, water systems, you know, like the tractor that would move. So I didn't have to go out there myself and move it. Right. Um, so you, you just learn to appreciate everything that we have here. And that the higher you go, the amount of people that you have that are trying to help you accomplish the, the program goals, you know. Right. Um, as far as the football, the X's and O's are much different. No I mean, the stuff that we're executing – uh, that we were executing at Elmer's College, uh, where the same stuff we were doing here and doing at Syracuse and at Purdue. And so um, that part's not much different. The guys, uh, the speed of the game, I don't think is much different. I mean, it, it, there is isn't there is a difference, but there there were a ton of guys we had at the D3 level that could run, yeah. that could roll, you know. And um, the, the length is a big difference. The, the length of the players, the length of the D linemen, the length of the O linemen, the length of the receivers and running backs uh, is is a major difference. Uh, the higher you go, and and the other one is, I, and I always say this, and I don't know if people think I'm crazy. I mean, uh, the good Lord only makes so many defensive linemen, and they're different. You know, the the defensive lines that we've had to face, the higher you go, it's a, it changes what you can do offensively. Um, you know, getting a double team and moving a guy off the line of scrimmage. Uh, it's a lot easier to do at the Division three level than it was at the Division one level. Yeah. Uh, you know, going against, you know, being the offensive coordinator, trying to move the ball against Aaron Donald was very hard. <laughs> it changed everything, you know. Right. Or Hutchinson this year. I mean, there's just been some dudes, Vic Beasley at Clemson. I mean, there's there's just some guys that can change games, right. you know. And uh, I think that's probably the biggest difference uh, of the of the level. You know, from the players' uh, standpoint, um, but it's funny because the Division Three, you want to do everything you can to help grow your players. You know, and it's the same thing you want to do here. You just have more resources to do it here. And if right. you go, you know, into a, a bigger league, then they even have more resources. But the goal is the same. You know, the goal is the same, which is try to get your players and grow them. And uh, so it's it's way more similar, I think, than people think. Uh, but there definitely are some some nuances that make you have to, uh, you know, maybe call a game differently or, or design a game plan differently Absolutely. Uh, because there's some, there's some special players <laughs> that, <laughs> that uh, make things different. Well, you, you, you may mention of that, that, that first head job, that D2 experience where you're, uh, you know, you're lining the fields, doing laundry, you know, all, all the stuff that I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with being a, a former D2 coach at one point in time myself. Um, how, how having some of those experiences – you know, yourself, now you're at this head coaching role at the FBS level and you have the resources to, to hire this quality control guy to make sure, all, you know, this part of the film is done. You got the you got the resources versus this probably five to six man staff that you were running around with, you know, a couple of years yeah. ago. You know, so I, what kind of perspective does that give you and allow for you to be flexible like that? Well, I think two things it gives you. One, it gives you the ability to 
to appreciate the right. people you have that are doing those jobs. Cause those are hard jobs no doubt. Uh, from what happens in the weight room to the logistics of traveling and the nightmare that that is that my DFO handles right now that I don't deal with. And, you know, his, his game day is the day before when we're about to get on a plane and he needs to organize all that stuff. And I, I you don't have to worry about that anymore. I just get on the bus and yeah. sit in the first seat. I'm good. <laughs> uh, so you just appreciate those people and what they do. And I think the other thing it does is it allows you to do more. You know, it's like, since I'm not doing all these things, what, where, what can I do more to give us a better advantage? Like what film can I watch? What, what room can I sit in? What meetings can I have with my players? What do I have time to maybe do some research on a software that could help us give us an advantage? You know, like it's awesome to be able to take some of those things off the plate, which just opens up more space that you want to fill, right? You want to find a way, what else can I do? Uh, Cause at my first job is at St. Joseph's college in Indiana. Uh, and we were, I was the, quarterback coach offensive coordinator and head coach so i had to sit in meetings and so you're just trying to find ways to do more and be better you know because there's so many things that uh, i'm very fortunate to have people that, that do for us now you know so it's uh it's, a, it's an exciting thing but it definitely gives you an appreciation for how hard people work and how many people it takes to really run uh a, a program that can have consistency and consistently win and absolutely more and more things happening that's making it harder and harder. We all know it. Uh, and consistency is probably the hardest thing to hold on to. Amen. And, uh, and that's, that's where all, everybody matters in building a place that these kids have fun and enjoy and, and want to stay with the program. Absolutely. Well, Coach, let's shift gears a little bit and, um, and move a little bit to personnel, per se. Um, Scott Moore, right? Fantastic athlete that you got running around that you had running around there at receiver for you guys he's got the opportunity to be a, a, a very high draft pick right um you know how do you leverage that into recruiting you know especially for you know I, I spent some time at a smaller F, fbs program and uh um, you know that group of five level and and, and and sometimes selling those high school recruits the opportunity to go play at the next level still exists here and you know exists just like it does yeah. at all other levels how, how do you kind of uh use that to leverage in recruiting I do it a ton. I mean, it's, it's, it's the dream of every player. Right. You don't show up at this level without that dream. And without. if you don't have that dream, you're probably not going to be a very good division one college football player. Um, so, so we talk about it a ton and we talk about, you know, our, you know, we have our core values and growth, you know, family commitment and growth are our three and growth is the one we talk about a ton. And, and really I always tell guys, there's no, I'm, I'm praying for the USFL. I'm hoping it happens. You know, the XFL, see if I want it to happen. But right now, there really is no viable uh, – there's no G League. There's no double-A, you know, triple-A right. baseball. Like, there's nothing. So, it's really – in recruiting, it's about finding the place that can develop you. Period. The end. Yeah. You know, and that's that's really what you should be choosing. You're playing. Like, who can develop me? And uh, and I would say, if you want to be a first-round draft pick, go to Alabama. They've had more than everybody. Mm -hmm. You know, they know what they're doing. Uh, we currently have nine players on active rosters. I mean, we're number two or three in all of uh, the group of five. Yeah. I think we're on top of, I think it's like 13 to 15 schools that are power five schools that we have more NFL players. Wow. You know, so we, we have been developing players, you know, and, and you have to be ready. You know, what, it, you know, there, there's a whole, I always call it the LeBron James effect. You know, in basketball, you can just get him and you go to the, you normally can go to the championship, right? Yeah. And like, and people recruit that way and say, well, if you come here, you'll be the first one to go to the NFL. We're going to all of a sudden figure out how to get a player to be a successful NFL player. And, right. And I don't, I don't buy into that. I'm, I'm more, you know, there's a track record right. of, of us developing players and putting them in. And D. Eskridge was a second round draft pick last year. Obviously, Corey Davis and Taylor Moten, and, and there's tons. And uh, Jalen Moore is with the 49ers right now. So so there's nine, and, and we got one, two, three going to go in this weekend. And that's there'll right. probably be another five that signed free agent deal. So it'll be interesting to see where that number is next year. Um, but we talked about that early on. You know, this is this is who we have. This is – and and, and it's, it's something that we're proud of, you know. And we like to tell people – about uh, our our alumni that are that are playing and living out their dreams and and then of course the guys that are that have jobs and that didn't make it I can't wait for there to be somewhere else for them to go no doubt and I played in the XFL version one you know I was one of the originals right uh, 
And, and I wish they had more of that because there's some guys that I really think at all levels I could use a year or two of development and could be a good NFL player. But right now the NFL is not a developmental league. Yeah. You are either ready or you are not. That's right. And, uh, and that's why I'm excited for Scott. He's ready. Yeah. You know, he's going to be a, I'm guessing a second round draft pick. I've been told by everybody he's going to be a second round draft pick, uh, which is going to be great for him and his future and, and the way he shows up and works every day. And, um, and I think our culture and our program does a good job of helping guys throughout their time here learn how to be a pro, you know, and right. there's some accountability there. And, um, and our guys not only have, have made training camps, but have actually made the active roster. That nine number is, I didn't do how many people made training camps. It's how many people made active roster. Yeah. Well, Coach, that's awesome. And I, and I love that you made mention, you know, um, uh, about growth and development uh, because that, that is, you're, you're right. That's what it's all about. And, um, you know, right now it's a big, big or I guess you just transition out of that fa- big phase of uh, growth and development with spring ball just ending. And, and, and you did graduate a lot of, of upperclassmen and, uh, you know, got, got some guys entering the draft here. So uh, you, you'll be looking at some, some, some new, new starters this upcoming season. So how did you kind of approach, uh, you know, uh, the, the development this this spring and, and a lot of guys in a lot of new roles and, and, and prior to that in the off season program. Yeah. You know, it really started two years ago. Okay. Uh, one thing I've learned by, by coaching at all the levels, is like you, you start recruiting two years before you lose people. You know, we knew we were going to lose three offensive linemen this year and we have, I think I have 21 coming to training camp in the fall and we got two transfers coming in. And we've taken two huge old line classes. So they're already here. This year's class, I only took one offensive line because I've taken so many the last couple of years. I'm excited about our line. I got two studs coming back and I got two transfers coming in and I got about six others that are ready. I just don't know who. We got to find five. And I got 10 dudes that are going to come to training camp. Yeah. Two returning starters, two transfers that were starters, and a bunch of dudes that have been here a couple of years that are ready. Right. So. Because uh, you can't bring in a true freshman offensive lineman and expect them to play. No uh, doubt, they haven't hit the weight room. They're just mush, you know. And uh, so, so we're excited. I don't know who the five are going to be up front, but I love the group. I mean, it's an awesome group to choose from. Uh, so we we started this a couple of years ago, making sure because it's really most of the guys we lose are on offense. I mean, our quarterback is going to the NFL draft, hopefully, and a free agent or a draft pick. We'll see. Um, and we got a young kid who's been our backup. He's really good. He's ready to go. He had to go in. We played fit this year. And we went down there, and uh, our, our starter had to get an IV because it was so hot, and our backup had to go in. And he went four for four, took us down the field. We scored, you know. So nice. um, it's fun to watch the next guy come 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 to fruition, yeah. you know. And so we'll have a new quarterback. We're going to lose Sky, but we got Corey Crooms, who is our second our one-two punch last year. So he's back. Um, we got our, you know, two running backs. We got Sean Tyler, who's kind of our starting running back, our star who's back. Uh, and, and our backup was an all-conference guy too. So uh feel really solid about our depth everywhere. I don't know who's going to start at all these positions that wide out in O-line. Yeah. I know our tight ends pop pretty good. I know our running backs pop pretty good. Uh, you know, quarterback, I, there's one guy that's in the lead right now. And, and, uh, you know, we're going to let them compete. Defensively, it's like they're all back. Oh, really? I mean, we lost, we lost two guys. Um, we lost two D linemen and have eight more that are ready to play. You know, so it's, we got uh, four transfers that came in, and we got four freshmen that weren't ready last year that are ready. Uh, all our linebackers, our whole secondary pretty much. I mean, it's, it's fun to watch our defense. I mean, they're in year three. They've gotten better every year. We're deep everywhere. We got a lot of guys that can cover. Uh, we move one guy from corner to safety just because we want him to play. And uh, he's a really good player, but he's just got too much talent in front of him. So defensively, I'm really excited. You know, there's no better time to have a new quarterback and some new pieces on offense uh, than when you have a, a, yeah. a great defense. <laughs> you right. know, so, yeah. so those guys, the amount of experience is crazy over there. Uh, we are going to miss our two D linemen that are gone. We lost the field corner. But we're gonna miss those guys for sure, um, but you know we have so we have so much depth over there, and so many guys that we had three starters that got hurt last year that missed the year and are back. Oh, that wow. kind of replaced guys. So 
So we're in really, really good position on special teams and on defense. Offensively, uh, great to have our running backs and uh, our two old linemen back, Corey Crooms, our receiver back. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's one of those things you have to plan ahead, right? Yeah. You have to know it's coming. Guy Moore leaving early was a surprise. I yeah. have to tell you that. Uh, and we ended up going on the portal and getting two transfers. We didn't really plan on bringing a transfer guy in, but we lost. Uh, one guy to the portal, one guy to the NFL. So we brought in a guy from Tennessee and a guy from Boston College. Okay. You know, that's where, um, that's where the portal helps. Yeah, no, you know, I don't. We don't live on the portal, but when when guys leave or guys go to the end, like Sky Moore is leaving early, he's going to be a millionaire by the end of the week. Yeah, you know, it's great for him. I'm excited for him. You know, uh, but and my young guys are almost ready. You know, where I where it gives you the ability to put a solid team together again. Absolutely. And, I don't ever plan on using the portal, but I it is a reactionary tool right. for hey something unforeseen happens. Yeah, uh, let's go find a guy that we really like that can play that's played college football that's been in a college weight room for a couple of years, and uh, and those guys over the last three years have been really good uh, pickups for us. No doubt. You know, and so it's uh, so yeah, it's it's an exciting time. I'm excited that we're going to have the defense we're going to have, and I'm excited to see what happens with our offense. Yeah. You know, uh, we have really good pieces, but uh, it it was it was fun this spring to um, to watch some new guys out there. There's some learning, growing thing. Absolutely, but uh, that's part of the deal. Yeah, no doubt. Well, that, that's awesome way to answer. I mean, preparation just just uh, you know been organizing your recruiting, know, knowing what it's going to look like down the road, and then obviously, like you said, you you get the curveball every now and again where. You're, a guy just is good enough to, to you know, for good reason, yeah, right? Yeah, for I mean, great, reason, great and, reason. And so that's awesome. But let, let, let me um, let me ask that question. But let me flip it a little bit. Um, let's talk about the uh, coaching. You know, you, you lost a couple coaches. Uh, just hired three new coaches, I believe. So uh, yeah. now it's not like recruiting and all that kind of stuff. But you do want to get guys that are going to come in and fit, fit the coach Lester and the Western Michigan culture and, and, and the culture that you, you're very familiar with, you know, so you don't have to get into everything that you did in the recruiting process, but, uh, or excuse me, in the interview process, but you know, just talk to us a little bit about how, how you find, find these prospects for, for, for your coaching vacancies and, and how you move forward with them. Well, I have to be honest with you, the, the thing that the consistency that we've been able to build at our level, we're going to lose coaches, yeah. right? Coaches are going to get an opportunity to go make, four times what they're making here. Right. And, and, and I appreciate that. And I'm excited for them. I want them to grow as well. And, uh, so, so I'm excited about all the coaches that have moved down. It's fun to watch West Virginia play and pay all the well, guys that I coach with right. are now moving on and doing great things. And it's exciting for me. Um, but I think one of the things that we've been able to do is I think some guys haven't taken jobs and wanted to be around here because we've been consistently winning. Yeah. Um, because unless it's a really good job, you're not looking. Right. Uh, but eventually that job's going to come that you can't say no to. Yeah, and that's happened that a couple times. But I think one of the keys for this place that I've been able to do is my experience at the D2 and D3 level, there are some really good coaches. I mean, really good coaches that are just as good as anyone else I've been around in the ACC and the Big Ten. Just oh, as good. Okay. And I know them. And I have a relationship with them. And the amount of coaches that I've given their first D1 job to, some of those guys have gone now. You know, the problem is everyone else. Corey Sanders, man, he played for me at that D2 school. He had me, a 25-year-old head coach. He was my strong safety on defense. Great player. I got him into coaching. I said, dude, you are going to be a great coach. And I gave him his first job. And then he kind of went off and was very successful as a head coach at the D2 level. I got this job. I bring him back. I think I'm going to keep this guy for a couple of years, right? Like, no one knows who he is. Right. He's been at West Florida and St. Joe. Like, no one knows him. One year. I had him one year. And Narduzzi called me. I was like, damn, Pat, how did you find out about this guy? He's like, ah, I'm recruiting. I heard this. And I'm like, dang it. And so now he's killing it there, you know, yeah. and love it. And he's doing a great job. I mean, I talked to him. He came over to the hotel before the game this year, and I got to see him. He's like my son, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, awesome. uh, but but we've we've been able to because of my relationships and how much time I spent at the D two and D three level. I know exactly. I have a list of guys that I would love to bring up here, and people are eventually going to figure out how good they are, and they're all going to get opportunities to move on. But if I can 
if I can, I need to find the best coach possible. And, uh, and there are some really good ones out there that, you know, sometimes you need to have a little bit of a relationship or know someone that knows them. And, yeah. um, and I know a lot of them, you know, and I keep hiring them, you know, uh, so it's been, it's been fun to be able to take some of those guys and give them their first college job and watch them just explode exactly like I knew they would. And, um, uh, so I do think that's one of the keys in hiring. I know I've hired guys from every level, um, but uh, my connection at some of the lower levels has really helped me sustain great coaches. Right. Uh, because you're going to lose them in the match. I mean, every year I'm going to lose two or three. Yep. And, uh, and so I'm going to have to go find two or three. So I make sure I'm always – I got to tell you, some of these big prospect camps, dude, when there's – in June, when there's 8,000 people there, I'm looking for coaches. Oh, wow. I mean, I'll get the text saying, hey, uh, I, you know, you want to watch number 758? I found it. You know, I'll go watch a recruit go through a drill or something. But there's so many kids at those camps. Until I get a text from one of my coaches, they're out trying to find the guys that we want to evaluate, you yeah. know. And I'm watching the young coaches coaching drill. That's all I'm doing. I found two of them that way. Like I'm that. like, who's this kid? And I'll wait in between. I'll shake his hand. I'll put his number on my phone. And, uh, I'm trying to find the next young. You watch a guy during a camp run a drill right. with a bunch right. of random kids he doesn't know, but he's taking the time to coach them, and you get to watch him coach them and the eye contact, and you get to see a guy in his element. Um, you know, I've I've found a lot of names, and I have a list of, from from those camps um, of guys that man, this kid did a heck of a job, and and now maybe maybe. You know, he, uh, then I normally invite him up to watch the spring ball practice or something and try to build a relationship with him. And, and then you never know when you, what, what position you're going to lose. Absolutely. Hopefully you're ready when that time comes. And, right. and so uh, it's been very successful for us. Yeah. Uh, thus far. That's awesome, man. I, 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 hopefully, we, we like I said, we do have a ton of young coaches that listen to this. Hopefully they can kind of hear that and let that resonate, you know, uh, how you're interacting with the young people and, and running through drills at the camps. You know, people are watching. People are always watching. And uh, just to hear that from a head ball coach at uh, FBS level, that, that's huge. So I appreciate you sharing that. Now, last question before I let you go here, Coach. Um, man, this is this is very unique to the MAC conference. I spent a little time in the Sun Belt, and uh, every now and again we have a Thursday night game, and it, and it was just always so hard to get back in sync, uh, you know, because you, you think about our, our plan days are probably around, around the same time. Yeah. And it was Saturday, you know, and you knew what you did on Sunday. You knew what you did on Monday. And, and the Mac, I mean, you guys were playing on Tuesday, Saturday, Friday, Thursday, Wednesday. How do you kind of uh, – I don't want to tie this to COVID, but I think all of us found ourselves in this position over the last year where we're trying to figure out what the heck is going on and been, um, you know, been adjustable and been able to adapt. But with the Mac, that's every week. So how, how do you kind of go through it and put together a solid plan for how you attack every week? Yeah, it's hard. I, I really, I'm like you, and, and I would say the things that we've done that I think have worked about, I've tried a lot of different things, you know, because it's like you're, you're, you know, you're testing different theories of how your kids will react better. But right. the one I think that's worked the best is a couple of things. One is it's kind of hot and cold. So the ones that I try to keep our schedule the same. Yeah. So I am a, uh, I will slide it sometimes. Uh, an hour back on a Saturday, we're going to have it. Let's say it's a Saturday, but for us, it's a Tuesday. Yeah. It's a Tuesday practice, right? When we wake up and it's Tuesday, it's Tuesday. I don't know what day of the week it really is, but for this program, <laughs> this it's a Tuesday. Right. Um, I might let them sleep in a little bit longer because I don't need to get them to practice, but it's going to be a Tuesday. So we, we really do. We have our Monday, our Tuesday, our Wednesday, our Thursday, our Friday. No matter what day of the week it is, I try to keep those days sacred and locked in so they so i'll tell them in the morning today is a monday this is what we're doing now the flip side to that so i'm really you know stringent when it comes to keeping that schedule but on the flip side is you do have a lot of you know eight week eight day week and nine day week yeah uh, and what i've done with that is the opposite i go for time off like oh, right. they need it because that's not that's november for us so if i get a nine day they got two days off or at least a day and a half off. Like, so I don't try to add to that five days and try to sneak extra stuff in. Like when I have a time, because we really, in our league, we don't get a Bible. We don't have one. We have a, a la our last Saturday game, and then we'll play a week and a half later on Wednesday, 
and then we'll have a week and a half before our last game ever. Like you have two half by weeks. Right. You don't really get a true bye week ever. Yeah. Uh, and they need some rest. So I've learned that I am going to, when I have time to give them off, off a day or two, I'm giving it to them. It, they, their bodies feel better. Their minds are fresher. Just everything from the season. They just need a little bit of time. But then when we come back, it's Monday. You know, we go back to Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. It seems that that seems that, that has been the best formula for us in in November. Maction, uh, yep. <laughs> where we action, uh, where we give them days off when we can, and when it's when we're here to practice, it's going to be a Monday right. or a Tuesday. There's days I get up, I get in the car, I'm driving to work, and no one's on the road. And it's Wednesday for me. It might be a Sunday in real life. Right. But I'm like, where is everybody? <laughs> and then I realize, oh, it's not, it's Sunday morning. Like, right. And it's six at six thirty in the morning or six in the morning. I'm driving and no one's on the road. I don't see any lights on, and it's like, what is going on? And then you realize it's Sunday. But for me, it's a Wednesday. Yeah. I'm going to do my Wednesday. <laughs> so, uh, so we do. We stick to the schedule. But on the flip side, uh, we definitely give them some time to relax and be college kids. And, you know. Well, sleep a little bit. Yeah. Well, one variable that is hard to avoid is obviously school uh, classes. The kids have classes. You, you, it's a Tuesday night. You have a game. You know, Monday night. Most of the time, you. I mean, I say Monday night. You'd be like you here and say the night before the game. You're, tr- you know, you're trying to trying to relax the kids and all that kind of stuff. So, yep. how, do, how do how do you guys manage the the, the class schedule? Do they go. I'm assuming yeah. they don't go to class on game days, right? Well, till noon. They have so to go till noon. Up to which noon. for us, wow. it's unique. It's it's unique for us because we were a morning practice team. Okay. Therefore, we don't take classes till noon. Okay. Okay. So technically, no one has classes, but they would have to. If they had a class that started before noon, they have to go. Uh, how about that? I mean, how many games, honestly, how many games did you miss? How many classes? Because, like you said, we probably played at the same time. How many classes did you miss? Yeah, I didn't miss any classes. Yeah. Zero. Never, zero. Never I missed zero. Yeah, right? Yeah. We yeah. played Saturday. And I didn't have a Friday afternoon class. So we'd get on the bus Friday afternoon, drive somewhere, play. That's right. Um, so it's so new. It is different, right. you know, like when you play a two, like a Tuesday night at Northern Illinois in the Calb, you know, we leave on Monday and they, if they have Monday afternoon and night classes, they're missing those. And all day Tuesday, we're in a hotel. We play Tuesday night. We drive this way. The game ends at midnight. We get out of there at one in the morning. It's two o'clock here in Michigan. We drive here. We get home at six in the morning mm. and it's Wednesday and they got to go to class at noon. They can try to sleep on the bus. So it's, it definitely has made it difficult. Yeah. You know, yeah. you watch other sports do it. You watch like baseball, basketball teams right. go away for a couple right. weeks and go on tours around the country. And still, I think, I have to be honest with you, I do think the ability and the comfort, the comfortability that we all have with Zoom right now has, has helped. You know, like the fact that teachers aren't afraid to be like, oh, well, let's hop on a Zoom call. Yeah. Like, it's amazing how this platform has helped. Uh, that because there's really no answer when you play on a Tuesday night in Athens, Ohio, which is nine hours away. Yeah, your kids are going to miss class, you know. And uh, right. and right around that time when we do Maction, it's November. It is like crunch time in yeah. these classes. This right. is when you're turning your papers in. This is when you're taking your final test before you get ready for the final. Uh, it's not like they're doing the first week of work where it's all like you know non graded stuff. These are the big time things. So it's some we talk about, and I think that's why another reason why when I do have chances to give them time off, uh, you have to give it to them. They need time to get caught up and, and to and to get because they're going to miss things. Something different than when I played, right? And something different than when you played. And it's it's a reality of being in the max, but being on TV and having millions of people watch you has been helping. You there is a it seems like there is a distinct jump in the amount of Mid American Conference football players that are playing in the NFL oh, yeah. since action started. I mean, it's we get. I try to tell people all the time. So there's, you know, 32 GMs and 32 assistant GMs. You know, and every Saturday they divide and conquer and try to go watch all these teams play, and mm-hmm. and and they want to go see their top prospects. You know, so it's amazing how many of those guys, the decision makers, not the scouts. But like assistant GM, head of player personnel, like the, the guys that are at the head of the table this weekend in the draft, 
uh, they all come to action games. Yeah. I mean, I remember the first one we had two, uh, Tukumo Korpor, who's the right tackle for the Steelers, uh, who played here for the last, uh, where he left two years ago. He graduated. Um, you know, he had a game and they all wanted to see him play. And, and there was like five GMs on the sideline of a Tuesday night game because they all know they can see them live. Right. And that helped right. our other running back got into a camp, I think, because they were all there. It was amazing that attention uh, to us in November right. and the ability for every GM to be like, don't worry about going to see Western Michigan. I already got them slated in November. <laughs> I'm going to go on a Tuesday. Right. There's nothing else on. Yep. I'm going to fly right. to Kalamazoo. And we had five GMs and three head of player personnel at one game. How about that? You know? That's and huge. they get to be up in the booth where it's nice and warm. Right. You know, they're up there. They come down for warm up. Yeah. I normally right. shake all their hands. Uh, and then they go up and watch and they get to see our guys play live. And it's, uh, it's huge. a huge advantage, yeah. yes, I think. Is, and, yeah. and, it, and it showed for our whole league. Because uh, then the next week we went to Northern and there were like four more GMs at Northern. So I'm on the sidelines yeah. there to see two, probably. And um, so it's really, it's really cool. It is giving them an opportunity to realize their dream. Right. So as much as it's a pain when it's a Tuesday, but really a Thursday, you yeah. know, it screws you up. Uh, it's not as great academically sometimes for our kids. There are some huge benefits. No, no, uh, to what we do. In yeah, November. yeah. That I mean, the exposure just for just for that logo. You know, even yep. even if you're not in athletics, I mean, for for that for the just the school in general, just to have that exposure, that four hour commercial on Tuesday nights of yep. you guys running around, it's humongous. So that's great. And I, and I kind of reflect back to my time I was at Louisiana Monroe, and we play on Saturday at seven o'clock, and you look down, it's like. God dang it, LSU's playing. And, and you wouldn't have anybody in the stands. You wouldn't have scouts there. <laughs> you know, So it was always kind of tough at, at those mid-major spots, yep. especially when you have yep. you know majority of your students probably have another team that they root for. So it was unfortunate. Right down the road. Right down the road, yeah. Hey, so. when, did, when did you play? I, I played in 2002 to 2006. So I was I'm, oh, I, I looked and saw that. I was a little bit behind you. Just, just we, yeah, I'm old. That's okay. But we played you guys. I was like, I want to say it was my junior year. We went down to Louisiana Monroe. You guys had uh, Marty Booker <laughs> and uh, and Glenn Foley, the DN. He hit me a lot. I remember him. <laughs> He's a good player. So Mar Marty. And, uh, so I actually, I actually only coached at ULM. I, I play, I played at oh. Baylor, but Marty oh. Booker, uh, very familiar with him and all that good stuff. Yeah. So very familiar he with was, that times there. Yeah. It was it was a cool. It was a, it's funny. That's one of the cool things about this sport. Like you travel around, and yeah. you, like you remember where you were as a coach, remember as a player, everywhere you get to go see the different. You know, yeah. That's um, right. I remember. It's funny you said because I was like, oh, we played, we played there. <laughs> you know, and we actually went down there, and it was cold. Oh wow, it was weird. Yeah, it was like <laughs> at the coldest day. They were all freezing, and we were like, man, fifty is beautiful. You know, <laughs> that's right. And they all had their long stuff on, and, and it was uh, it was amazing. But yeah, it's uh, it's it is cool when anything you can do to help these kids realize their dreams, you know, and and, Amen. and we're we're getting more and more guys from smaller schools. They're not that small. I mean, we're square FBS programs, but right. uh, that are getting the attention. And the NFL does a great job of finding the best player. That's right. If you're the best player. They're you. gonna find you. That's right. You know, and and it, it does help when you're on national television, which we are, which is huge. And um, so and 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 a lot of times in order to make it to the NFL and like you gotta play, you gotta play well, and you gotta play a lot. You know, you you don't there aren't many like the one and doneers that go and make it, you know. So, you know, the ability to come to a school like ours and maybe play a little I mean, Sky Moore plays a true freshman. He was an all conference receiver his freshman year, sophomore year, junior year. And and that consistency has allowed him to leave early. That's right. You know, and he's gonna go. He's gonna realize his dream. I was texting with him this morning and trying to figure out where he's gonna go. It's like a Rubik's cube yeah. trying to figure that out. But <laughs> um, but it's exciting. It's exciting yeah. to think about, and I'm I'm looking forward to, to watching his name be called this weekend. Absolutely, Coach. Well. Uh... I appreciate the time with you, man. It's been fantastic. 30 minutes there to share with you. Uh, phenomenal job, what you're doing with your alma mater there. Uh, you know, congratulations on the success and wishing you continued success. All right? Thank you. Appreciate you, Mario. All right. Thanks, Coach. Bye. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of Inside the Headset. If you heard anything on this episode that you would like to learn more information about, head over to afcapodcast.com where you can find every episode and all of the corresponding show notes. 
While you're there, take a second to rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast. If you have any questions, comments, or suggestions for the show, please let us know by sending an email to podcast at AFCA.com. Make sure to follow the podcast on Twitter at Inside the Headset and tag it when you share each episode. You can stay up to date with all things AFCA by following the at We Are AFCA Twitter account. Every episode of Inside the Headset can also be found on your favorite audio streaming platforms such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. If you are not currently a member of the AFCA, be sure to find us online at AFCA.com and apply to join over 10,000 NFL, college, and high school coaches from around the country who are striving to be the best they can be. With an AFCA membership, you gain invaluable access to the annual AFCA convention, the bi-monthly magazine, and the new and improved digital library, which contains thousands of videos and articles contributed by hundreds of current and former football coaches. You can also visit AFCAinsider.com to sign up for our free weekly email newsletter on the right-hand side of the screen. It comes out every Tuesday at lunch and is filled with great articles and stories written by many of the same coaches you hear on the podcast. It's geared to help you become a better coach tomorrow than you are today. Be sure to connect with me on Twitter at Coach Mario Price. And remember, the AFCA is not just an annual convention. It is an association that continually promotes education, guidance, and networking. But it is also so much more than that. The AFCA is about celebrating the past and educating the future. It is about developing great coaches who will produce great teams and even better people. So invest in your skill set and impact today by engaging with the AFCA.